Okay, good afternoon. Thanks very much for coming out. Uh, I'm not sure how many people of you were here last week, but I couldn't make it. So apologies for those who were here and for me not being here, which is great introduction. It was Nick here, and if you missed it, you can catch up as ever on the YouTube channel. And he was talking about the role of demand side reduction. Uh, so this week, I'm really delighted to have Tom Left down here from the Energy Systems Catabolt to talk about the power of flexibility. I say that at the beginning just to make sure people are in the right room for the right talk. Uh, I wanted to hear more about what um, response there being to some of the electricity market arrangements and reforms that are going on. And I'm just delighted when Tom said he would come down. Tom, having worked previously in departments that no longer exist, nothing personal, I guess, but uh, Department of Energy and Climate Change as was, and then Bayes as well. Uh, but I was also interested to see that you worked in the Japanese embassy in Tokyo, helping British companies to uh, energy companies to export. I'm assuming that it's not energy they're exporting, but technology. Um, the other thing that I thought was quite interesting is Tom's not come from the classic engineering background and really thinking more about development, economics, um, also the Japanese mixed in there as well. But I was delighted to see you reposted something about measurement of grid inertia and things like that. So you write down in the detail. But with uh, no more ado, uh, Tom, I should have said you are, I've got a, a formal title on you, I haven't, have I? So Senior advisor. Senior advisor to the Energy Systems Catapult, but please, Tom. Thank you very much. Well, it's yours. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, re really pleased to be here. Thanks thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Tom Luff and I'm from the Energy Systems Catapult. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is in a sec. Um, I think um, Rob just gave a uh, great introduction to me, but my I've been at the Catapult for, for about a year now, um, focusing on electricity, uh, sort of electricity's role in the net zero transition um, and sort of all, you know, all aspects of that. Um, as, as I just said, um, I, I was uh, most of my career has been in, in government. Um, so working, yes, um, Bayes no longer exists. DEC, which was before Bayes, no longer exists. Actually, before that, I was in a thing called the Office of Climate Change, which was really the very beginning of what we did. And, and, and actually before that, I was in this bit of DEFRA called Global Atmosphere, where we did the original um, UK emissions trading scheme um, and, then, and then started doing EU uh, trading schemes. So this was this was a long a long time ago, but um, but really um, have have kind of have done done lots of different things across um, government in this in this area. Um, and um, I think what yeah what what strikes me most is is how many different aspects to it there are, including kind of um, stuff like grid inertia and the the real engineering challenges through to the the policy challenges. Um, but today I'd like to talk about practice this. Uh, it's, I'm trying to get on. Uh, to focus away from the, uh, the presentation screen to let someone in. As oh, I see. Fine. Sorry. That's fine. Try again. Great. OK, so um, today I'd like to focus on on um, on power system flexibility. So I've, I've cheekily called it power, power of flexibility. I'm not sure if that quite works as a title, but I thought I'd putting power and flexibility in there and try and make something worse than that. But um, really looking particularly from a markets and policy perspective um, and, um, and and wanting to you know, emphasise the massive importance of flexibility in the power system, um, looking at kind of current blockages, limitations uh, of with the current approach, um, looking at the government reform programme, so, so that's REMA, uh, um, and I'll talk about that, um, and then potential solutions, and then talking a bit about what's coming up, and um, thought we could explore a bit kind of what gaps there are, particularly kind of analytical and and evidence and research gaps. Um, I'll move on. Actually, can you do this one? Can I? Yeah, I'll move on to um, talking a little bit about the catapult, and and also I just, I'm, that's this is where this is where people are online. So um, if you can't hear me for any reason, obviously um, shout and um, we'll, we'll sort that out. Um, but the Catapult um, is uh, an innovation centre um, and the mission is is all about unleashing uh, innovation as part of the, the net zero the clean growth uh, transition. Um, we've actually now got about 250 people. Um, Physically, our location is, is Birmingham, but, but mostly people are scattered across the country. And we're really aiming to bridge gaps 
between the various parts of the sector. Um, in terms of um, how we do that, big focus on on sort of whole systems thinking, which is a bit of a a, a bit of a kind of a catch-all. But I think there are three chunks of that that we're talking about in particular, sort of bringing together the the physical uh, side of things. So looking from generation through to consumers, um, looking at kind of different vectors, um, electricity, heat, transport. Um, and look different, I suppose, agency within that. So physical system, the, the virtual system, the market policy. And, and I think bringing all of that together is what we think of as a whole system. Um, and that's what we what we try to do uh, there. Um, and, and the way we, we do that is having um, different capabilities. So different sort of expertise within uh, within the organization to look at the problems from different angles. So we've got kind of modelers, um, digital experts, um, consumer insights experts. Um, I'm in the policy and markets and regulations team. And then we've got so systems integration and, and engineers. Um, so, so that's a little bit about, about, about where, where I'm from. Um, before um, talking about the, sort of the specific challenges, um, oh, sorry, I, I got to go to this one. Um, I'll, um, but before talking about the specific challenges, I just wanted to sort of put the context um, into place um, and um, sort of see see this as you know really wanting to stress the the, the really formidable challenge that is sort of power sector decarbonisation. And um, this graph um, is the best I could do at trying to put that all onto one one schema, one 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 graph. It's not mine. It's a it's a national grid one. But but this is just showing that um, in the next kind of 20 years or so, we expect electricity demand to, to, to probably double or more than double. Um, and that's driven by electrification of heat, uh, heat pumps in homes, electrification of transport, um, EVs, um, uh, ele further electrification of industrial processes. Um, and at the same time, to be able to power all of that will have a massive increase in variable generation, so sort of offshore wind and, and other stuff that you can't control. Um, and going from about, you know, what we have are at the moment, less than half of the power comes from, from uh, variable generation to, to probably about sort of five sixths or, or, or thereabouts, but a, but a significant amount. So a big proportion uh, of the, the sector, of the power sector will be, will be variable. And, and what that means uh, clearly is that we need lots and lots of flexibility, other sorts of flexibility to be able to match that supply and demand. And I know that's been talked about a huge amount, but I think that 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 focus on flexibility is is absolutely key. Um, enabled by digital and data, um, we'll, we'll need to prioritise this, this flexibility um, and um, Bayes or um, Desnes, I suppose as they're called now, um, uh, talk about between 30 to 70 billion uh, worth of, uh, of savings across the system by, by between 2020 and 2050 if we can if we can get that extra um, flexibility into the system. Um, next part of the context is we've had electricity market reform before um, and uh, this is sort of 10, 10 or so years ago uh, a little bit more, um, we had the the uh, electricity market reform. So this is a really ugly, ugly slide. But um, uh, three objectives there about security supply, about getting sufficient investment into low carbon technologies and about trying to maximise benefits and minimise costs. And there were four policies, but I'll focus particularly on contracts for difference, but contracts for difference, capacity market, which is about uh, supply, um, making sure that we have the sufficient supply, carbon price, price floor and, and a performance standard on, on emissions. But I think really driving or that, that what that has done is it's really scaled up deployment in renewable power, especially offshore wind, and it's driven down costs uh, of renewables and again, particularly offshore wind, but, but others as well. Um, and I, I said I was going to focus particularly on, on um, uh, capacity, uh, sorry, contracts for difference, but what that what that has done, putting in place um, private sector, sorry, private law contracts, um, revenue um, uh, stabilization and price discovery through auctions has has just really um, seen 
uh, the cost of offshore wind um, go down way, way more than than could have been expected at the time. So massive success there. Um, uh, and we've seen a huge uh, increase in deployment, um, leading to really, really ambitious targets being set for the future. Um, so I think this could say this is a first really important stage of the transition to, to net zero power. Um, however, um, what we've all we've got we've got lots and lots you know got, got lots of renewables now you know much more than we thought we could get and and we've got really big targets for the future but what the challenge is now as I see it we, we see it in the catapult is about modernizing the systems to introduce that greater flexibility and, and enable that all those renewables to be integrated into the grid or onto the grid um, and so what 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 we've learned um, is that there are big issues, risks under the current framework that we now know more about uh, because of variable generation, distributed energy, how integrating that creates all sorts of challenges. Um, and also, and this is partly because of the, the design, we've not seen the demand side response and storage that we that we need coming onto the system. Um, including given the, you know the potential that we've got for for digital and data to, to support that, and I suppose capping all of it is since then we've got a, a new target, a much more ambitious target, which is net zero by 2050, as opposed to net zero, as opposed to 80% uh, of 1990 by 2050. So um, that that means that the, the the sort of the the stakes are higher. So. Really, what what we're talking about is new phase of reform or EMR two um, to to introduce greater system flexibility um, in order to integrate renewable power onto the grid. Um, so I'll, I'll next I'll talk a bit about some of the challenges of doing that, um, and um, this is this is um, a sort of an overview, and I'll get to talk a bit more about each of these as we go through. Um, just to just I'll do a time check, but we we want to finish probably by about thirty five fast and have time for conversation after that. Okay, okay. I'll just make sure I'm looking at the time. But if you um give me a shout about getting over, um. But um the our work program in the uh, energy system catapult re rethinking electricity markets um identified some fundamental challenges faced by the current market arrangements. Um, and um, starting off with um, inefficient price signals. Um, so price signals in the market that don't reveal the full value of the energy at that point and the, and the flexibility. Um, there are some specific challenges that I'll talk about in relation to some of the EMR schemes. So the CFDs, capacity, capacity market in particular. Um, there's carbon price incoherence across the system. Um, strategic planning um, is 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 not is not good enough, and we've not really started to, or we've not really kind of captured the um, the progress on on data and digitalization. And I'll I'll talk about some of these uh, in in more detail. I won't. I, I'll actually focus more on the first three, not so much on the, on the last three um, today. But um, there's there's plenty more stuff on there if um, if if that's useful in the future. Um, but where do I start? And I, and I, I think I, I sort of start here, which is about transmission reinforcement. Um, and um, it's it sort of um, it's been in the in the news quite a lot, actually, over the last few weeks. Um, and it's becoming quite a mainstream issue. And I think people are starting to, you know, it's, it's sort of seeping, seeping out of the industry that actually Building grid is 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 one of the biggest blocks to meeting our our target. Um, but the reason I wanted to start here is to really sort of think: well, the value the value of electricity and understanding that and and why we focus on that so much. But fundamentally, so the value of a product is around is a sort of function of the supply and demand. Um, but the complication when you think about electricity is that um, you need to think about where it's produced and where it's consumed and we need to also factor in the cost of transmitting it um, so if you have um, uh, challenges to getting the electricity from where it's produced to where it's consumed 
you've obviously got constraints because you don't have the kind of the, the, the grid in place to do that. Um, and so I think that that kind of consideration of this is a quirk or a, a kind of a fundamental factor of, 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 of electricity is that that kind of where it's produced, where it's consumed um, and the constraints to getting from A to B. Um, and what we need to do, you know, that that's all very well if you're in a steady state and you keep doing coal and gas and you don't really need to build very much out. You just kind of do what you always do. Um, so in the past, you know, you've got gas and coal relatively close to demand centres. Um, you know, you built all of that, that stuff back in the, you know, early, early part of the, the cent last century. You know, you can gradually just kind of keep increasing it um, and, and you're all fine. But when you shift to renewables, you're going to need stuff in very different places uh, around the country, offshore sometimes, you know. Um, and so there's a big challenge in building all of that stuff. But also in terms of thinking, actually, if you've got somewhere some, some power production a long way away, um, there could be a constraint in getting it to where you need. So despite all the progress in renewables deployment to date, so we've had you know significant increase, we've not really seen the scale up in um, in grid build. And this this graph just shows where we ha where we you know how we've done so far, sort of where where we are at the moment, and where we've got to go to in the future. And um, on all accounts, it's it's a massive scale up, sort of probably eight times faster than what we've what we've kind of currently been doing um, over the last decade. Um, and so um, the question about sort of who pays for that and 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 um, and how it best operate, uh, you, you know, sends best good operational signals is really key. Um, the next the next kind of bit of, sort of data I wanted to show, and I don't know how clear this is if you're a bit far away, but I'll try and explain this. Um, but but um, current arrangements. For, for operating and paying for the grid is, is kind of creating big, big problems. Um, another eight, but we've seen an eightfold increase in the cost of managing conge congestion on the transmission network since January 2020, uh, sorry, January 2010. So that's that, that's these kind of constraint payments, um, the kind of system where national grid, if there's too much generation in certain parts to be able to, to for the grid to be able to cope with, they kind of have a system of constraint management where people bid in to get paid not to produce in that area. Um, and so that cost was something that was uh, considered sort of necessary to allow renewable generators to connect onto the system without being able to build quickly enough to accommodate them all perfectly. Um, and um, I take some part in the, uh, in the blame for um, being uh, it's a, um, one of the officials that help design and, and implement the connect and manage system, which we currently have, which basically allows generators to connect before the grid is built. Um, and you have a system whereby you you kind of, um, as I said, pay, pay them not to produce if, you, if, if, if they can't be accommodated onto the system. But this is now, um, and that was sort of about, about 2012 when it was introduced. So um, about 11 years on, becoming a big a big problem and we anticipate that up to three billion per year will be spent uh, on congestion management um, by 2035 so that's in about in about sort of 12 years time and that's even after you know more transmission and distribution lines are built just the sheer scale of the difference between where things are you know where the generation is and where the demand is um, and um, uh, so that's one thing. It's kind of costing a lot of money. But the other thing is um, the the system operator, so national grid system operator, is moving from being um, a kind of residual operator in the market. So just repositioning the market about sort of from from 2010 or so. So about five percent um, uh, of its uh, um, uh, sort of um, uh, re, re, you know, t taking about five percent of the market, going right the way through to looking in the future. Um, uh, well, sorry, actually, even now, 
to being more than 50 percent. So it's kind of really shaping the market through its actions. Um, and that's not really what it was designed to do. So it's it, it's kind of um, taking on this extra role that's increasing cost. Um, so that that was really talking about some of the fundamental market challenges. Um, I want to then talk a bit about some of the challenges with the EMR schemes themselves and their really undermining incentives for flexibility um, uh, in, 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 in certain ways. Um, do we need to let someone in yeah. or? Um, no, no worries. I'll just use this opportunity to drink. Um, but now what the graph is showing is that the capacity market awarded most of its contracts to conventional um, sort of non-flexible, well, conventional flexible, um, but but um, uh, sort of traditional uh, generation. So 68% went to gas um, and only 2% went to demand side response um, and 3% to sort of battery storage. Um, and that's challenging uh, if you think that this is how we secure the, the sort of supply in the system. And um, by 2035, we need to get down to, you know, effectively zero carbon, although maybe we'll have a little bit of, of, uh, of, of gas left on the system then. Um, so why, why is the capacity market doing that? Well, um, it's, it's focused on procuring the cheapest electricity or electric capacity. And so it does have those unintended consequences in terms of um, what, what it's choosing to, to go for. But it's also got quite a com conservative methodology um, and it's resulted in um, uh, oversupply and, and, and sort of wholesale price suppression. But actually, one of the ways that it, it really um, impacts on flexibility um, is that it's, um, it's, it's distorting the wholesale price and, and making there no real business case for someone to come in and say, actually, I've got some battery storage. Um, I'm going to set that up so that I know that when prices are high, um, I'll be able to make my money back. Um, CFDs also um, have um, uh, challenges in terms of flexibility and they're fundamentally they're, re they're encouraging generators to produce electricity even when it's not needed by the system at that time instead of incentivizing them to, to sort of to store that excess power. As, as well as, um, oh actually we need to, it's uh, can I do it from here or no? Excellent. Um, uh, as well as the schemes, um, the actual kind of the way the network charging regime works is also um, uh, undermining uh, the, the sort of the drive for uh, flexibility. Um, so very limited incentives to turn up, turn down. So what that means is if you um, if you can, if there is a constraint, you know, if there's too much power going through a bit of grid um, instead of um, there being signals for people to say, actually, I'll use less at this particular time. Um, there, there, those those sort of signals don't really exist. There is some locational signal uh, in terms of where to use the grid, um, but that's very, very weak. Um, so it doesn't really incentivize people to choose where they put electricity onto the system or choose where they take electricity off in terms of supply and demand. Um, a lot of the reinforcement is socialized um, and um, and also institutionally reforms have been pushed back. It's a very cumbersome process of reform. Um, just just um, finally on this kind of or actually penultimately on this kind of what's what's stopping flexibility um the way the retail market is set up um it is also um a big challenge and um in particular uh, what this graph shows or this this chart shows is the breakdown of the electricity bill and the scope for what you can flex on it so even if you had a really smart tariff uh that gives you kind of real time um uh, real-time prices only about a quarter of it would be able to be flexed the rest is kind of fixed um or or it's a network cost 
Um, I just I should note that this is from 2021. So over the last year, that would look very different because of the way gas prices have pushed up um, wholesale prices. But if you think that that will probably not be uh, an enduring uh, situation or, or may not be an enduring situation, um, then it's in all likelihood it will go back to looking a little bit more like this in the future. But as well as, well as that, there's challenges in terms of um, uh, not many flexible tariffs on the on the market. And I think that's partly due to or a lot to do with kind of uh, how commercially sustainable they are with current arrangements. Um, the, the, the single national price in the wholesale market doesn't really reflect local constraints. So there's limited uh, value of flexibility for consumers. Um, and also the different bits of value that consumers might be able to get. So by playing into, say, um, uh, the balancing services or local flexibility, those those things that they could do by shifting when they um, use their electricity, it's all dispersed. And so it's very hard for them to capture that um, that benefit, even if it was passed on to them by a by a retailer. Um, I'll just put this one on um, just quickly just to say and, and I won't dwell on this very much, but it's a very nice, nice chart. And so I thought I would I would share this. But the the carbon price signals across the system are are in are in, incoherent. So um, the way that we've set different policies up, um, we've kind of created effective carbon prices. Um, and so very crudely, you can see here sort of what the what the kind of effective carbon prices for, for different sort of sectors across the economy based on sort of how much we subsidize them, what regulations there are in place. Um, and generally they're not they're not always pushing in the right direction. Um, and they don't always favor low carbon solutions. Sometimes actually they lead to the uh, the the, the uh, uh, converse happening. So um, in particular thinking about heat pumps versus electric sorry, um, gas um, boilers. Actually, the way um, that we have prices at the moment means that it's actually probably more sensible for people economically to buy um, and to keep with their boiler. Uh, but actually, that's partly because of the way the subsidies are, are working and and um, rather than it being inherently um, uh, a, a good thing. Um, right, I'm going to go on to, to some of the solutions. Um, but, but with a with the starting with the, with the kind of um, the, the existing what the, the, the regulatory um, uh, reform programs that are underway. Um, uh, this is very dull, but this is kind of all of the busy landscape that we that we've kind of got at the moment. So the ticks are kind of what's what's kind of been done. Um, the kind of question marks are what's what's kind of on, ongoing. Um, I won't I won't talk in um, detail about about these, um, but it's I think it's useful just to know that there is lots going on across the sector. Um, lots of it's quite slow um, and take a long could take a long time to to be implemented and uh, and so on. Um, but what I will focus on in particular is the um, is the review of electricity market arrangements and the and and to some extent the retail strategy refresh. Um, So the review of electricity market arrangements, this is um, the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero um, uh, published when they were called uh, Department of Business, Energy and Strategy last July. Um, and uh, this was billed as a, a kind of a, a big um, review of uh, the, 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 the system um, and really some quite good detailed analysis um, I've kind of claimed that um, uh, it's kind of built on some of the energy systems catapult uh, analytical framework. I wasn't there when that framework was developed, so I can I can claim that without without looking big headed. But um, it's actually a lot of the analysis is is uh, is similar. And actually, the fundamental conclusions of uh, of Rima um, and the and the consultation that was published last year. Um, uh, are, are are very are very positive in terms of really understanding what the challenges are. So, <clears throat> I'd say kind of to to summarise, um, they say current current arrangements do not maximise the potential for flexibility. Um, price signals don't fully um, address the needs of the system, <clears throat> and 
uh, the fragmented policy framework um, uh, is is uh, could lead to um, and the, the the lack of integration of uh, of, of um, the 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 uh, renewables that we need into the future. Um, this this is sort of what was then published um, uh, last March. So a summary. I, I say this. This is uh, what was published in, in in March was a summary of responses. So what what all the kind of people that read. Rima, all the industry stakeholders and, and so on, um, fed back and gave their responses. Um, and um, I'll talk about the, the, the chart in the middle in a sec, but the summary of responses um, was pretty overwhelming in its consensus that you know, current arrangements won't deliver the change that's needed to reach um, our decarbonisation targets of 2035. Um, and also pretty categorically agree, agreed with the statement that market design changes should be considered. However, um, there's no consensus on, there's no consensus from stakeholders on, on the best way forward. And, and what this chart is showing is, is the various different policy options that have been, are, are in, kind of on the table uh, for, uh, for RIMA still, uh, with a few that have been taken off. So um, those in red, um, are are kind of ruled out um, by by the government. Those in orange still on the table, but but as part of a broader package. And I won't kind of talk about each each of these ones uh, separately. I'll talk a few about a few in a second. But just to say, across the board, there's I'd say I categorise them in terms of level of ambition. So you've got kind of a, a business as usual, business as usual plus uh, set of policies, which might involve kind of you know change slight changes to the existing uh, mechanisms right the way through to some really quite radical big changes uh, like um, uh, changing the, the the fundamental market arrangements uh, such as locational pricing or um, or split markets you also got um, differences in terms of um, the kind of objective that these options are focusing on so decarbonization versus uh, security supply versus operability. And, and really what you need is a package of, of, of some of these to go together to get all of those objectives because you can't really have one uh, without the other. Um, I'm going to jump into sort of what we're what we've been sort of talking about and uh, in, in the catapult and the, the kind of the, the reform package that we would like to, to see. Um, this is this is biased um, in the sense of others got different views, but this is kind of where we're coming from from a fairly first principles perspective um, on it, and we can sort of talk about about that um, in Q and A if that's if that's useful. Um, but sort of six six fundamental things about making electricity markets work more accurately in time and space. So so talked a bit about some of the challenges there before. Thinking more about outcome based policy mandates. Um, evolving uh, policy to support financial market development and contracting for investment. Um, thinking about when we want immature technologies to come on, how we redesign support for those to avoid distorting the markets. Um, we need to look at governance and uh, codes um, and how those decisions are made. Um, and then also aligning sector strategy and policy mandates with, with carbon budgets. Um, I'm going to focus particularly on on one and two, but I just want to sort of note that I think you need to think about these things as a package of things rather than rather than individually. But um, there's not there's not really enough time to get through everything um, today. Um, nodal pricing is is the way that we see the best way of um, of of addressing that challenge of um, of of, of um, Electricity generation and demand being different places, and how you how you overcome that, um, and and it's it's fundamentally about um, about about kind of changing of how you how you charge for electricity and how you how you pay people for the electricity that they produce, and currently we have a single price across um, all of the the market, um, and that um, that un underlies um, uh, it, it, sorry it masks. The underlying reality of the, the big variations in supply and demand balances across the system. So if you think about it, 
if you've got um, Scotland and you've got lots of offshore wind being produced there, not not as much demand, there's an imbalance of supply and demand there versus if you're in London and you so there you might have too much supply and not enough demand. And if you're in London, you have lots of demand, but actually it's quite far from other places that produce um, uh, renewable electricity. So you've got that that kind of imbalance, even though the system as a whole or rather across the whole system, you might have the same amount of demand as supply. Um, so that the single price that we have across the uh, electricity market sort of masks those those imbalances. Um, and so this this the regional variation is growing more markedly as we decarbonize the grid. So what nodal pricing does, um, and it's also called locational marginal pricing, it, it, it's, it's a method for determining prices in which market clearing prices are, are calculated across several different locations across the grid. Um, and so you could either have that as a nodal system where you have hundreds of past, possibly even thousands of different um, places where the, the price is determined, or you can have a zonal approach, which is perhaps sort of, you know, a handful, seven or eight maybe, um, uh, where that clearing price is determined. Um, each price, or rather the price each node reflects the locational value of energy right there. Um, and so it's a more efficient way of determining actually how much people should pay. And it also sends much better signals in relation to how much flexibility you might need um, and, and actually when and where you should be um, using electricity. Now, clearly, um, you can't, if you're a, a domestic consumer, you're not going to sort of suddenly move house to Scotland from London to be able to produce or use uh, cheap electricity. Um, but perhaps if you're kind of a heavy uh, industrial user and you're thinking about setting up, you might think actually um, there's a you know much cheaper electricity prices in Scotland. Maybe I'll go up there or Hull or wherever. Um, but even if you can't move, the signals that locational pricing would send you would be much more sophisticated in terms of when it's best, when it's the best time for you to use electricity. So therefore, if you can then um, uh, optimize or rather use storage solutions either in your house or on a kind of a transmission level, um, you can get much, much better use of the of the system. Um, I think I'm going to move on from um, from this bit from this one, but we did some research into this and um, not it was pretty it wasn't particularly granular. Um, we, we looked at just seven zones as opposed to a much more granular kind of nodal approach um, based on sort of publicly available data and on transmission congestion from from national grid. Um, and the approach aimed to capture um, a significant proportion of the congestion on the on the on the network while keeping the model kind of tractable. So it's it's a it's this was a kind of a an, an early pioneer attempt to, to model the potential benefits of moving to a more granular uh, market structure. Um, the conclusions were were really interesting and showed net benefits for for all consumers um, uh, on a, in aggregate across across all all regions uh, for the time period considered. So um, it's probably not that easy to see, but the red dots on there show the kind of the net uh, um, uh, value. Uh, for 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 consumers in each area. So in in each area, um, they're above um, zero. So everywhere benefits. Um, some places, uh, like in in London, um, the wholesale price uh, is is more expensive. So it's it's shown as a negative, but that's offset by uh, reduction in the const constraint costs, which is the the sort of the pinkish um, uh, uh, bar. Um, and what's driving those uh, those benefits? Um, uh, it's due to more efficient location of uh, 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 location and dispatch of, of uh, generation um, and more efficient use of grid and interconnectors. Also, more investment, it would it lead to more investment in storage um, and, um, and, and that would then drive greater opportunities for flexibility. These are really kind of conservative assumptions that we used uh, and based on very, very simplified reforms um, but we're supporting um, a consultancy, F FTI at the moment, do some work for Ofgem, which creates a much more granular model. Um, and that work should be publishing um, fairly soon. Just in terms of um, 
whether this is a, a wacky new idea or or not actually locational pricing is 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 actually the norm across a liberalized uh, world uh, or liberalized energy um, so um, again it's probably difficult to, to make out from a distance but um, if you think about if you look at this and think of or, or see on the for each year group uh, the left hand side is the non-liberalized market so let's let's just look at the next three for each year group then you've got national zonal and nodal and uh, in 2000 quite a lot of national uh, markets so that's the type of market we've got now in the UK on GB and if you move forward to 2020 actually it's about uh, well it's it, the, if you add together the zonal and the nodal that's more in terms of capacity than than national so it's actually the more more dominant than than people um, uh, often think um, countries that got zonal pricing Norway Japan Sweden uh, nodal includes New Zealand and most of the American uh, North American markets. Um, Ontario in Canada is moving to nodal. Uh, uh, it, it's got a reform program to do that. And I think Australia has been considering it. Um, OK, just just uh, moving on from that, um, another big pillar of what we're thinking about has been sort of outcome based policy, um, and that would be a way of moving away from targeted specific uh, policies like CFD, like the capacity market, and putting the onus on um, the outcome you're trying to achieve. And in this, this case, it would probably be the supplier. So it would be to say to the supplier, your, your energy supplier like Octopus or uh, EDF or whoever, um, you have to, um, uh, you, you've got a maximum amount of carbon that you're allowed to sell electricity with. So the carbon intensity of electricity set at a, a cap and that decreases over time into the future. Um, a little bit like uh, what we've seen with the uh, banning of um, internal combustion engine cars. Uh, you sort of say by 2035 or 2030, you know, that's got to go down to zero. Um, and so that sets a really clear expectation of what's needed um, and um, puts the onus on suppliers to work out ways of, of, of meeting that, uh, th that, that target. Um, I'll just finish by talking about all of this stuff is kind of fine in the wholesale market, but actually we need to bring it back into um, the, sort of the retail and uh, and what it means for consumers. Um, and you know, to date, the decarbonisation that we've seen has been, you know, it hasn't really been seen very much very much by consumers. It's it's sort of something that's happening out there in the system, but actually, you know there's not actually that much that has needed to be done by consumers and, and that that's clearly going to, need to change if you see projections for how much um, EVs and heat pumps uh, will need on the road and in houses um, in the coming coming decades. Um, so we need to think about how the retail framework changes to, to sort of um, support that that transition and we did a bit of work um, last year um, sort of setting out at a fairly high level what we thought um, uh, the, some of the challenges are there and what, what could be done about it. Um, I think um, fundamentally um, there is a need for policy reform to cr make sure that we've got the retailers that we need for the future um, and uh, really about sort of, um, how that can unlock innovation. I won't I won't talk about that in detail now but again we can come back to that in, in q and if that's um, if that's useful. Um, um, just finally, looking ahead, um, big milestones over the coming months. So the building on what I was saying about retail, there's a call for evidence in the summer from from the Department of Energy Security Net Zero. Um, the second REMA consultation is due in the autumn, um, which um, may put some granularity or some detail on on packages of options and and hopefully set out some quantitative uh, analysis about which ones um, do what. Um, and then uh, Ofgem, uh, the regulator is uh, following up on its distributed flexibility call for evidence, which focuses particularly on the on the sort of the, the more local side of distribution, uh, sorry, of, of flexibility. Um, just as a, as a bit of a brain dump, um, I, as I was going through this, I thought there are particular evidence gaps to focus on, but um, I would be 
you know really keen to understand what you think about where uh what you know wh where where those gaps might be but i think consumer response to flexibility options i think or flexibility opportunities i think is is a is a real gap in our knowledge how how are people gonna how are homeowners um uh sort of renters different people in society going to respond to uh you know be able to deliver the flexibility that we need from them um different models of locational pricing different ways of of, of kind of um getting that locational signal into the market could we shield certain consumers you know certain groups of consumers could we phase it in but how how will we how will we do that and then i suppose implementation of change something that's often not really uh looked at very much by by government funnily enough but actually there's probably quite rich data information about how implementation you know imp implementation went in the past and i think learnings from those are are really really interesting um i i will stop there and would welcome comments suggestions anything um that people on people's mind um and yeah thanks for thanks for listening thanks very much thanks. We may have some questions on the um, consumer side and on data as well. Um, just one observation, I think before the wholesale market was affected by gas price increases and so on, there was political focus on the fact that network charges were the fastest rising component of the bill, mm. which was probably fair, but now recognising you need massive investment in that. Mm. Are we ready to come back and examine that part of the bill? Uh, and the, the thing I was going to put in context, I think the hydro scheme in Scotland mm. recognises that some remote locations should be paying more, but they need to be protected from that already. Mm. So there was already enshrined this kind of protecting people from locational cost disadvantage. Yes. So I don't know if you've got any comment on the political setting for that. Yeah, I mean it's pro that's it's a it's a big challenge. Um and I think the the approach has has often tried to balance the sort of socialization of the costs uh with the efficiency. So the sort of the fairness with the efficiency. And obviously if you have you know if you if you, if you take one perspective you say well why why am I being penalized for I you know I want to do the right thing. I want to build um you know, more uh, renewables. Uh, uh, why am I being penalised? Because it costs more to connect to the grid here um, than other places. But then if you take the efficiency angle, you say, well, actually, you know, you might want to build it there, but it's not actually needed. Where it's needed is here. So send the signal that that's where that's where you want it. Um, I think politically, we're, it's always quite a long way behind the sort of, I suppose, um, the realities of, of of the grid. And so I think um, the the kind of political debate is is not very sophisticated. It's, it takes a while to, I suppose, for it to catch up. But obviously, it's got a different, you know, it's got a different agenda. Um, I don't. I think. I think. Um, uh, you know, high, high level politics will, or at some point, the reality of the grid will 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 take over. And I think if we're seeing evidence that it's significantly cheaper to run the grid in a more efficient way um that that could sway the politics which is sort of well actually it, it's for some people it looks like it's unfair and especially if it's kind of combined with very targeted measures to support those that maybe lose out from a change um but that but but yeah that politics might get in the way of that um evidence-based policy well yeah yeah Shall I come to the audience for questions? Do you like to start then? There are so many things to discuss, so I'll try to I'll focus on one, which is on uh, the outcome-based uh, approaches. So I was wondering how is that different from the renewal and obligations? Like seeing that and, and the history of the renewal and obligations. In yeah, I mean, it's it's actually a good point because um, when I was working in in department, um, my job was to kind of try and uh, turn renewable obligation into a bit of a legacy program and shift towards the CFD. Um, and I think that was the right thing to do, um, not least because the renewable obligation uh, was 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 very expensive relative to what we expected in the CFD, although we didn't realise it'd be quite so successful. Um, but also um, because um, it, it was um, not uh, it, it, it was it was done in a very administrative and, and banded way. 
Um, so basically it required government to sort of set an administrative um, price for, for each of the sort of technologies it was supporting. Um, in some ways, going to a supply obligation would be similar to that, um, but it wouldn't be about sort of supporting, it wouldn't be about paying for um, the generation. It would be the suppliers would then work out how much they had to charge for electricity and they would then have contracts with um, perhaps PPAs or, or whatever with the, the generators. Um, I think also you wouldn't want to see too much banding anymore. Um, uh, and the, the, although it was good to have banding, i.e. different prices for different renewables um, to support them in the early stages when they were at different stages of development, I think now most of the technologies are supported by the CFD could be kind of cons more considered mature technologies and therefore treated similarly or altogether. Um, but, you know, the, how you how it work in terms of trading or having obligation, you know, sort of tradable obligations, I think that would be something to, to work out whether that would be a good way of doing it or, or, or not. Questions? Um. I'd be really interested to know if Energy Systems Catapult are focusing on any uh, sort of answering these evidence gaps that you've identified. And specifically, I'm being very interested to know about the consumer sort of side of things, people's acceptance of flexibility. Yeah, well, um, on that on that first one, um, I mean that's we we are we there's a there's a program of work that the Department of what designates Department for Energy Security Net Zero is uh, is sponsoring, which is called Alternative Energy Markets. Um, and sort of innovation for for alternative energy markets, and what that's doing is it's looking at different market scenarios, a bit like some of the ones that are set up there. So perhaps sort of business as usual, um, a kind of locational pricing one, and, and split market, and then um, testing um, innovative propositions that suppliers might have. So different flexibility tariffs, and and testing them against that to see how do the different market conditions impact on what those propositions um, are and then or, or what those were well, the value the propositions can unlock um, and then that's the phase one and phase two will be looking at then testing that with real people either suppliers um, uh, kind of um, customers um, or using our what well, we've got a living lab which is sort of um, 1500 homes across the country that kind of agree to be tested on um, and then seeing actually which tariff um, kind of unlocks what what flexible um, uh, you know value um, but it's still quite crude and um, I think more and more kind of understanding well possibly looking at other other jurisdictions what's happened what's worked maybe looking at different sectors um, I think there, there's just a there's a gap in understanding of actually what people will want to offer and what what will what will get them to offer it sure um, I've had a follow-up question actually, but there's I was going to sort of stylize in the research community two answers to that consumer response question. One of them is what you just characterized, which is kind of get the price signals right with all the spatial and temporal granularity that you're describing, and then sort of things will flow. And then the other sort of view more from the sort of social science end is there's an awful lot of kind of stuff going on to do with kind of trust and risk perception and people's capacity to see control to systems or to networks, like whether people are participating because of their own financial values themselves, mm. when they feel part of a collective endeavour to read the net zero, mm. and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the more you go in the latter direction, the more what happens in this context with distributed flexibility depends on what's happening in much broader kind of digital mm. uh, and energy centres. Mm. So I was wondering if you, yeah, I, 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 or a sort of series of a, a, a questions about how you, where you sit on all that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's really interesting. I think um, uh, that yeah, there's there's probably not one one single answer to that. But um, you know, firstly, I think that that trust question is is really important. And um, our main kind of delivery uh, partner, if that's the right way of calling it, the people that are going to actually have to try and get people to do stuff are retailers sort of suppliers um, and they don't have great reputation at the moment um, I suppose and and, and you know how how are they going to persuade people who are not you know don't really trust them um, to, to to kind of take up flexible tariffs when they you know it's really complicated and 
you know, they, they might not they might not kind of feel protected. Um, so I think that there are, there are lots of different ways of, of kind of thinking about how you might address that. One is make sure you've got the kind of the retail policy framework in place or, or, or understood what's needed. So consumer protection, you know, you, 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 I think we all, we all probably buy into the idea that there's got to be some more volatility in prices, but whether that's passed on to, you know, consumers directly or whether it's absorbed by retailers is a question. And also how you obviously want to avoid a situation where a consumer kind of suddenly gets a bill for a thousand pounds because they left their fridge on, you know, uh, uh, you know, so how to give the confidence to people that those eventualities aren't going to happen. And actually, if you if you choose to, you can just have a flat rate, you know, like you've always had. Uh, I think that kind of, you know, backstop is is, is really important. Um, I think there's a big job for for energy companies to up their game, um, increase the trust, sort of demonstrate that they're going to be actually providing the things that people want um, and, uh, and and do that in a really transparent way. And regulation might help that. Uh, but but fundamentally, I think people think we want to get to a system where retailers are competing on on that kind of credibility rather than p- competing on. We will give you the cheapest possible tariff. And, you know, I think, you know, that's a bit more sophisticated way of thinking about competition. Um, I probably didn't address all of it in terms of thinking about kind of com- community engagement. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is there. I think how to bring in the massive amount of really good will and effort that's their energy on on the com- community side, bring that into the sort of the framework uh, in the best possible way. You know, it it needs to, but I don't I don't know the answer to that. But I think I think that's something to explore a bit more. One motivation we've noticed is the smart meter campaign now talks about use smart meters to reduce the reliance on imported energy. So that's a change in motivation. Yeah. And why were so many people engaged in the energy saving over the winter period? It's to avoid an external pressure yeah. causing blackouts in Britain. So it's recognising there are motivations. At the same time, politicians are always driving for the lowest possible price of energy, which yeah. maybe as a single message is fine. But you're now regulating also to try and protect all consumers and maybe we're overprotective and we should just protect the most vulnerable who are not enabled to participate mm-hmm. and then just allow the market to do its dirty work. Sorry, Tina, I don't know if you wanted to respond to that. Um, well, slightly, it was about your question about sort of doing nodal pricing or different regional prices yeah. for people. So there's well, my question is the, the countries that are doing that are households. I think householders in different parts of their country seeing very different prices. And, and my second thought was from what you were saying, I mean, obviously, households are not going to move. Mm. You said, mm. It's going to get cheaper electricity prices. So the signal you're trying to send to is the, the supply side, isn't it? And as we know, there's lots of controls on yeah. where supply side yeah. sort of interventions are, but you know, planning. There's all sorts of ways of an industrial strategy, and there's all sorts of ways you might try and design a better supply mm. side, know what you know. So, I mean, is it is it good mechanism, given yeah. that it raises huge equity comps and being did the other countries do it and is it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So really, really good um, questions. And I think um, on the demand side, uh, it's, it's, um, it's complicated, I suppose, in that, um, you know, you kind of want policy mechanisms or market mechanisms to actually uh, market mechanisms to uh, incentivize behavior and on the demand side it seems like you're not you know that that's not really the aim of what you're trying to do with locational pricing in the sense that you're not trying to get people to move um, and, and 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 that makes people think well what's the point of it then i think i think that's where i'd say for industrial users actually you might you might see some change and that and that's a good thing but for householders the value is in the, the, the temporal signal so what 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 you get from um uh you you know arbitrage i suppose so you know using your electricity or, or you know when, when electricity is cheap versus when it's expensive and the incentives that would give you to actually invest in you know if you could save um, you know, £100, £1,000 a year 
by doing that, then you're going to invest in a in a smart battery. At the moment, there's no way you're going to do that because there isn't that opportunity to save money. So just thinking about, well, you could enable some really good change um, by 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 kind of moving down that rate. But obviously there could be challenges to get there. So what's the role of government in supporting those people? So, you know, um, buy batteries or, or or whatever. So I think I think I think that's 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 one one part of it. Um, you could also think about well, if you don't want to expose domestic consumers to it, could you shield them from locational pricing? So effectively, through one mechanism or another, they're trying to pay the same in London as they would be in Scotland. Now that would maybe dampen some of the incentives, but it might be more politically acceptable. On the generation side, I think there's less argument for for sort of dampening those signals. Um, it's not to say that you're going to suddenly see the offshore wind come down to the tens, but actually you might see just ten percent change across the you know across the system. But the but by by making it much but by that change would then be a more efficient system, and you would then have quite significant savings as a result of it. So it's kind of at the moment there isn't that signal so it's basically wherever the wind is strongest you go to as opposed to balancing that off internally with well actually it's far away and the wind is strong is that better than going somewhere else where the wind is also almost as strong but but much much closer so you so even though it, you know you're not you're not sort of saying you're going to just change everything but marginally you could get quite big savings if you if you send those better signals i suppose i don't i don't know if that was in any way <laughs> Yeah, but any, making a distinction for the for householders between time of use and sort of location of use. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but so in the in the countries that are doing this kind of locational pricing, are they passing those price differences through to households and businesses, or are they just using it to shape the supply side? Um, so it's a mixture. So some some um, some do it as a um, uh, purely on the on the generation side. Um, I certainly some do it on both. Um, and I think some um, shield certain consumer groups, so uh, such as domestic, but industrial um, that face the kind of the, the full, full signals. Um, so we've got two questions. Do you, do you want three? Do you mind if we start the front and we come back? Sorry. Uh, a couple of comments on that exchange and then a, and then a quick question. Um, from the US side, from most of the markets in the US, the demand is um, shielded in the um, while you've got nodal pricing, you've got it regional, somewhat regional, maybe not uh, ISO system operator wide, but uh, broken down into balancing zones uh, for the for the retail price. Um, the comment about the industrial loads maybe changing, I don't think we've seen that in, in the US so much. Typically, what they'll do instead is they'll um, buy a PPA from a like a financial PPA from where the power is cheap. Yeah. But the, and then on the demand side, one of the unintended consequences might be, and we've seen this in the US and especially in the West, that um, where the wind is blowing, uh, the nodal prices are negative. And so it's it's really dampened. Well, it's it's beginning to dampen because they're still subsidizing it uh, by the renewable energy credits, but it's beginning to dampen. The renewable investment in the Midwest, and you might see that in North Scotland. Uh, on the other hand, as you pointed out, maybe they they just pull the pulls the power here, lowers the transmission needs. Yeah, I mean, um, I think you you might see a dampening of of um, the some of that investment signal in some in some places, but then where there's strong you know strong demand, you would expect to see it. I have increased, but, but but then I suppose the, to the extent that it can, and I think this goes back a bit to the previous question. If you can't do it much anywhere else, then it will still be incentivized to go in the place where you know where the wind is strongest. It only it, you will be paying you know different prices for it. Only if the only if the transmission built it is built out to get it there, because otherwise yeah, it's going to get curtailed, and you're going to end up with negative prices. That it, absolutely, and I, I think I, I should say sort of it's not either or. You 
definitely need to scale up the transmission. Um, and you do that on the basis of knowing that where it's most likely to be needed. But I think at the margins, you could see the less transmission being required. Absolutely. Um, and actually, that leads me to my very quick question. Um, you mentioned that even with transmission upgrades, there's going to be an increase in congestion cost to about 3 billion. Um, and so it looks like about 20 percent. Is that um, in the context of a nodal market or is that That's based on status quo? Based on status quo, because in, in the nodal market, you wouldn't have the same sort of congestion cost. It would be internalized into Consistent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that's based on current arrangements. If you sure. And I think that's a it's probably a, an FTI um, number. So that the, the consultants FTI, I think they, they came up with that number when they made the model system. So we go right to the back. Sorry, you've been patient there. Yeah, uh, thank you. This is just about in the same direction of um, the possible benefits of locational pricing. So given the large political economy constraints around building um, renewables work, like most generation yeah. assets, especially in land and onshore work, to what extent, like how much you expect the market to respond to this price signal, given the myriad of other countervailing factors that might make this weaker? And yeah. would this, you know, like, can this fix the problem? To what extent does it like, even more the problem through sheer market force. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think um, in all the modeling, you kind of make assumptions about how much stuff can move and you have to make assumptions about planning constraints of an offshore wind. And we've had a, a difficult relationship <laughs> politically with, with offshore wind, uh, sorry, onshore, onshore wind and difficult, difficult political sort of challenge there. Um, and I think all, all of these things are unknowns. So you can make an assumption, but they're unknowns. I suppose what the benefit of locational market pricing would do is it would it would give you a much better sense of actually what is more effective to do or what's best, more efficient to do where. And if then 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 you just you demonstrate whether your assumption is right or not. Um and, and so I suppose in particular, um you might not see. Um, and I wouldn't expect you to see a wholesale shift and say, well, everything it just gets close. You know, every, everything is done in, you know, it, where the demand is because there are those constraints. But it might send much stronger signals about, well, actually. Wh where is storage going to be a better solution? Where maybe CCS is going to be, you know, carbon capture and storage. It would send a really strong signal for where you want hydrogen to develop, you know, uh, electrolysis and um, electrolysis and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I suppose the way the way I try and imagine it is that if you if you think of the millions, tens of millions of different energy assets you'll have on the system and you need to have on the system to be able to kind of predict through assumptions where they all should be, ideally, is just folly. But but if you have clearer flexibility or clearer signals that tell you actually this is where they should be, doesn't mean that everything moves, but you kind of it, it, it goes to it's more likely to go to where it should be. Um, so yeah, and 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 I think the modelling we've done suggests that even though that's not changing, it's not changing where everything is. It still gives you a pretty significant um, benefit. Um, right, I think we're going to take two more questions, gentlemen. On this side first, please. Thanks very much. I, you just touched on it then, I think, but the on the storage side, um, notice your your sliver on batteries was was quite small. I think it was two or three percent. Yeah. Is that an area that you see? A lot of growth in, and, and how quickly does that have an impact on the supply side? Um, I think I think we, we are we are. I mean, one of the big challenges people come about kind of uh, when they say when we say oh, there's not enough flexibility, and they say, well, look at the scale of increase in the uh, in the in the storage, you know, um, investment. And I think I think that's right um, that that it, it you know there, there is already um, you know quite quite significant scale up there. Um, but I, I think, um, and so I'd say, you know, for face value, yeah, there's lots and lots of potential for that. Um, I think, I think it's just that, um, is it fast enough to keep up with, um, you know, the, the sheer scale of increase in the flexible generation that we've got? Um, and also, you know, where is it best to go? Do you have strong enough signals for that? Um, and, you know, also what type, you know, is it, is it, is it battery? Is it kind of, um, 
uh, other types of um, uh, storage, including including kind of vectors like um, uh, uh, hydrogen. Yeah. I don't. Was that? Yeah. 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 yeah no, that, okay. Yeah. I guess it's a whole big topic in itself. But. Yeah, but I mean, I, I definitely think that. Um, I mean, just just going back to this kind of question about will people want to be turning up and down there. Uh, lights or whatever. I mean, I, I, th I think probably the view is um, it will be automated and um, by the time <clears throat> my mum needs to do any of that stuff, it will be a case of it's done for her um, through either through, uh, you know, through smart switches or probably more likely through her having an EV or, her, you know, someone investing in a, in a smart battery for her um, rather than, yeah, Lots and lots of behavior change, but but behavior change is probably we do need to exp, exp, you know experiment with that behavior change to understand that and and to see what 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 potential that has. Right. So we had a question on the other yeah. side. I uh, suppose behavior change is politically challenging, though, isn't it? Right. That's that's the issue. So, but on the supply side, building a little bit what you were talking about, what are your thoughts around the role of you know because I guess renewables is is very mm. intermittent and um, abated natural gas. Which sort of seems like the, so that, that's a big sort of slug there that could be yeah. achieved with CCS, right? We've yeah. Got lots of natural gas in the system, but you know we, we need to get to 2035. Yeah. We need to be net zero 2035. That's that's really quite soon. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts around the base of gas? I mean, if, in the equation. So I, I think fundamental composition of any low carbon technology is important to uh, consider. So if, if if it can come on quickly enough. Um, and it can be cost effective, then what's not to like about it? I think that the, the challenge is um, you know, just that. Is it is it going to come on quickly? Um, it's difficult to decipher the the real technological progress and the kind of the, the cost it's going to end up at um, from sort of, I suppose, industry spin. And, and it's uh, it's, you know, some countries, some companies will be very keen to say this is the answer. Um, because it allows them to maintain their existing business models. But but if it you know if we can make that happen, and yeah, there's some really good signs I suppose from government um, over the last few months of of kind of investment in there and and sort of developing the regulatory regime to support it. Um, but you know there's you know, maybe increasing confidence that it, that it could be a really big you know important part of the of the, of the solution. Right. 